I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to the show. We're going to jump to it right away. We have a lot of things to cover. Today we start a two-part series on the JFK assassination. Yeah, you heard right, the JFK assassination. Mark Lane returns. Many fans of the show remember Mark Lane was here several weeks ago. He was down in Jonestown during the massacre. He told us his real-life story. He was also the lawyer for AIM, the American Indian Movement. That's Wounded Knee, 1973, the uprising there. All those shows are in the archives. Real Life History, folks, as always, I say, www.brenthollandshow.com. Today, Mark Lane was the first whistleblower on the JFK assassination. From the outset, things were just not right. The cover-up started immediately. And I say cover-up purposely because I, for one, believe 110% that there was a conspiracy to assassinate President John F. Kennedy. Without hesitation, I can say that there are just too many anomalies and coincidences, quote unquote. Mark Lane was hired by Marguerite Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald, of course, her son, folks. He was the purported assassin of President Kennedy, supposed to be only one lone gunman, fired the shot from behind President Kennedy. Mark Lane did the investigation and found out it was impossible for Lee Harvey Oswald to have even shot a rifle that day, let alone assassinate the president. Mark Lane. Not one shred of evidence, not one shred of evidence, which moved in the direction of showing that Oswald had been involved in any shooting at all that day. In fact, the uh, president was killed by a rifle shot, and a paraffin cast test taken by the Dallas police showed that there was no nitrates and suspension on his face or on uh, one hand, meaning that he could not have fired a rifle. Remember that he was arrested mm-hmm. shortly after the assassination, and even Washington would not have removed those uh, traces. So the evidence was only that Oswald could not have killed the president. This afternoon, real living history. Mark Lane and the JFK assassination right now on Brent Holland. We're off and running, folks. I'm speaking with Mark Lane tonight. Mark Lane, of course, was one of the first whistleblowers, if you will, in the JFK assassination. He has had an amazing career. Just let me tell you a little bit about that. I'm going to read this from the biography section of his book, Plausible Denial. Mark Lane is an author, lawyer, teacher, lecturer, and filmmaker. And that's what he does in his spare time, folks. He has written eight books on contemporary legal issues, ranging from an analysis of the assassination of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. to an account of the facts surrounding... Are you ready for this? The Jonestown Massacre. Yeah, that's right. Mark was the lawyer for Jim Jones and the People's Temple. Mark Lane's highly acclaimed bestseller, Rush to Judgment, a critique of the Warren Commission. And as you all know, the Warren Commission, folks, uh, for those of you that weren't around, is the commission that was set up just after JFK's assassination, November 22nd, 1963, to investigate the assassination. And uh, we all know now that that Warren Commission report is full of holes. And Plausible Denial, the book I have right in my hands right now, presents the startling results of that pursuit. Mark Lane has served in the New York State Legislature, oh yeah, and worked as a New York City campaign manager for John F. Kennedy himself. Lane represented the American Indian Movement, AIM. Now again, this is a very historical fact, at Wounded Knee, 1973, and he was the only public official arrested as a Freedom Rider. Freedom Riders, folks, again, for the folks that weren't around during that time, during the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s, Freedom Riders went on buses from city to city and demonstrated for civil rights for black Americans. I want to welcome Mark Lane to the show for the very first time. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Happy to talk with you. Let's jump in right away, shall we? Let's start off with JFK. You first met him in 1960. There's a great picture in Plausible Denial, your book, of you and JFK. I was actually a candidate for the New York State Legislature. He was a candidate for President of the United States. He asked me to meet with him and later to become one of the two campaign managers for him for New York City in his presidential campaign. At that time, the Democratic Party was split. There was the old guard, Tammany Hall, led by Carmine DeSapio and organized crime. That was one section. And then there was a new section which we formed, that is, I did, together with Eleanor Roosevelt, former Governor Lehman, Tom Timletter, former Secretary of the Air Force, etc. 
a whole group of people got together to form a reform democratic movement. And Kennedy was running for president and wanted to have everybody in the Democratic Party support him. So they had the regular organization appoint one person to be his campaign manager, co-campaign manager for New York City. And I was chosen by the reform movement to represent Eleanor Roosevelt and Governor Lehman and others in our movement. And so I met with him. He endorsed me and I supported him. He supported me. We were both elected. His election was a revolutionary in large measure in terms of what was to take place. And then three years later, he was assassinated. And when he was, J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, on the very day of the assassination, said that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin. He acted alone. There was no conspiracy. That's before the investigation began. And then the FBI issued a report stating basically that the new president, Lyndon Johnson, appointed a commission led by Earl Warren, who was the chief justice of the United States, but he wasn't the most active member. The most active member of the Warren Commission was Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles had been the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, who was fired by John Kennedy for lying to him about the Bay of Pigs invasion, a whole series of events which took place. And so Kennedy fired Dulles, and now when President Kennedy was killed, Dulles basically ran the commission to investigate the murder of President Kennedy, which put him in a key position because the CIA had actually killed President Kennedy, and his role was to cover that up, and he did that really well. The Warren Commission report was released the next year to the absolute support of everybody. Everyone in the news media, New York Times, CBS, NBC, everyone in the news media in America said it was the greatest thing that had happened, was considered to be the greatest investigation in the history of America, etc. The only problem was that I knew it was not true. And so I conducted my own investigation. I talked to key witnesses, went down to Dallas, et cetera, and I wrote a book which not one publisher in America would publish. Not one. I went to every publisher. It was called Rush to Judgment. I ended up in London talking to an old conservative firm there, the Bodley Head, about 100 years old, and they agreed to publish it. And when they did, one American company said they would publish it, and it became the number one best-selling book, according to the New York Times, that year when it was published. Number one best-selling book in America for 1966. Came out paperback the next year. Number one best-selling book in America in paperback, and then in 23 other countries as well. But it was a book which shattered the secrecy surrounding the assassination of President Kennedy. He offered no theories, no speculation, merely compared the facts to the conclusions reached by the Warren Commission. I never thought it would be a best-selling book. It had no sex in it, no pictures, and, and it had 5,000 citations and references, almost like a law book, just comparing the, what the Warren Commission said to what the facts were. You're listening to The Brent Holland Show. For more information on today's guests, as well as free podcasts and downloads, please go to the www.brenthollandshow.com website. www.brenthollandshow.com Okay, let's just back up a second. And That's how it all began. Okay. Please. What didn't smell right to you right off at the beginning? Because, you know, I was six years old when President Kennedy was killed. And I remember where I was. And I always remember my parents saying, especially when the Harvey Oswald, who folks, as you know, was the purported assassin, was killed only three days after by a fellow by the name of Jack Ruby. And once it came noted that Jack Ruby indeed had mafia connections, the whole thing just kind of didn't smell right. What did it for you? Well, uh, Ruby, uh, that played a big part, I, of course as most people in this country here in Canada, I'm sure, saw it, it was a live murder on television. Ruby come out and fire a shot and kill Lee Harvey Oswald as he was in handcuffed and in the two police officers in the basement of Dallas Police on Court's building. Jack Ruby walked up with a gun and the building was allegedly to be sealed off. He walked up with a gun and fired the shot and, and killed Oswald. That caused the, those who had believed that Hoover was correct, the director of the FBI, in stating that Oswald was a lone assassin, were sort of astonished by this. Ruby actually worked for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and Ruby was also on the staff as an investigator for Richard Nixon, who was at that point was a member of Congress for the House on American Activities Committee. Ruby worked for him. All of these documents came out many, many years later, but they're official documents, and there's no question that these things are so. But I guess the killing of Oswald and, and seeing Oswald originally when he was being questioned by the reporters as they moved him from one room to another short little glimpses of him. He said, 
I don't know what they're talking about. I, will some lawyer come forward and give me representation? I didn't do anything. I don't know what they're talking about. Then, of course, there was no trial because he was killed. Of all of the evidence being covered up, most of it was by the government at that point, the single most obvious fact of the destruction of evidence was the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald. If Oswald had not been murdered, he would have been tried, presumably, since he's, they said he did it. And there was not one shred of evidence, not one shred of evidence, which moved in the direction of showing that Oswald had been involved in any shooting at all that day. In fact, the uh, president was killed by a rifle shot, and a paraffin cast test taken by the Dallas police showed that there was no nitrates in suspension on his face or on uh, one hand, meaning that he could not have fired a rifle. Remember that he was arrested mm -hmm. shortly after the assassination, and even Washington would not have removed those uh, traces. So the evidence was only that Oswald could not have killed the president, and yet there was such a resistance in the United States. No one would talk about it. Now we're talking about it, and we've been talking about it for years, but from the time of the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald, for more than a year and a half, not one single newspaper, not one single radio or TV station permitted one word of dissent in America. Not one word of dissent in America from the official version. You couldn't get on the air and talk about it. I did reach people on, on local radio stations in the United States, and the only way I reached people in more than one city at one time was when I went to Canada and was involved in, in radio broadcasts, CBC and other Canadian radio stations, which, of course, got came into border cities, certainly like Detroit and many other cities in the United States. That was the only way I could reach people in America in more than one city at a time was by broadcasting from Canada. Folks, we are lucky to have a living history guest tonight. Our guest tonight is Mark Lane. He's the best-selling author of Rush to Judgment. Rush to Judgment is the first book that blew the whistle on the Warren Commission and challenged the Warren Commission's findings, because there were so many holes, not only in the investigation, but in the outcome. It was so obvious that it was a cover-up even back then in 1964. Subsequent to that, Rush to Judgment was made into perhaps the standard, if you will, the benchmark of all films on the assassination. You can find copies of it on YouTube, and I will put those links. I would encourage you all to watch it. Don't forget, this was the era before, way before the internet. If you were doing research, you had to go through the files manually. There was no plugging in something into Google and then finding all the hits and just choosing the ones that oh, best. Oh, yeah, life has changed so much. Oh. Uh, believe me, I've been writing books since that time, and uh, more recently, too. I just finished my autobiography. Let's talk about that, Mark. I've been working on it for 10 years. And I just finished it. I've been practicing law now for 60 years. Six oh. Wait a second. Did you start practicing when you were what? Two years old? Three years old? No, well, not that young. But uh, and I spent time in the army during World War II, and then came out and uh, went to college and law school, and very quickly, and then started practicing. But 60 years. When I, I write my autobiography, it's like writing the biography of someone else. What was he doing 55 years ago? I remember a lot of things, but I don't have notes about everything that I did, even many of the important things that I thought were important, still think probably were. But with the internet, I can discover everything. Of course, I also have, under the Freedom of Information Act, which I brought, actions which I brought to, together with the American Civil Liberties Union, we were the first ones to utilize the Freedom of Information Act, which was the one piece of reform legislation that came out of the Watergate efforts. And so they passed the Freedom of Information Act, saying that we could get a lot of documents. Of course, the government didn't want the CIA, FBI did not want to reveal documents. We brought action in the United States District Court, the federal court, and they ordered the production of these documents. The greatest treasure trove for me in looking back over what I did each year is reading the FBI reports because I was constantly under surveillance by the FBI and they wrote reports about everything that I did, which plane I took, what city I was in. So it helped me put dates on various things that I was doing at that time because they kept a record even though I did not. One thing I want to get over to the folks too, Marguerite Oswald, folks who was Lee Harvey Oswald's mm -hmm. mom, approached Mark Lane to represent Lee Harvey Oswald after he was killed. Mark, can you just tell the folks a little bit about how that came about? I wrote an article about the Kennedy assassination 
I had interviewed a couple of witnesses by telephone, called Jean Hill. She was there. You can see her pictures of the Zapruder film. You can see her there. But I called her. I read her name in the New York Times, and I called her up, told her I was looking into this. And uh, she said, well, do you know what Dealey Plaza looks like? I said, no, I lived into Dallas. She said, will explain it to you. And then she said, up, and the shots came from a grassy knoll, which was on the president's right side. And I said, can I tape this? And she said, of course. And I said, and I believe that information to some of the news media. That's how that little piece, that little green hill, got the name Grassy Knoll. And she didn't even know that she had named it. She was just describing it to me. But I met her many years later and said, you, do you know that you're the one who named it the Grassy Knoll? And she said, I didn't know that until I read your book, Citizens Assembly. Well, you said it, but I, I didn't know that I was going to name it. In any event, I got a lot of information. I wrote an article, and not one newspaper not one magazine, not one scholarly publication. No one in America would publish it. This was in 1964. No one would publish a word that I wrote. It was an analysis of the evidence that we knew at that time, and it didn't reach any conclusions, but said there has to be a more serious investigation than what's taking place now, because these are serious questions which have to be addressed. And I raised a lot of questions based upon what witnesses had said, and uh, no one published it. And then I got a phone call from Jim Aronson, who was the editor of the... National Guardian, the newspaper doesn't exist anymore, it's a publication of the left, it was a publication of the left, and they said, we'd like to see it, and I said, I don't want to start this off in a political way on the left or the right or any place else. You can see it, but you can't publish it. And they had it, and they said, we want to publish it, and I said, I'm trying to get it and look or put some of these other places, which are allegedly non-political. He said, well, we want to publish it, and finally, when no one else would, I gave it to the Guardian. And it became a huge bestseller. It was a relatively small, it was a national publication, but not with a large circulation. But they printed an additional 100,000 copies of just that part of the newspaper, the supplement of the newspaper. It was a huge thing, 110,000 words or more. Today, I got a phone call from Marguerite Oswald. It seems that a woman named Shirley Martin in Hominy, Oklahoma, I didn't know her, I didn't know there was a city called Hominy, Oklahoma, she read it and sent it to Marguerite Oswald. She didn't know Marguerite Oswald either, but she just said, this is something you ought to read. And so Marguerite Oswald called me, the counsel for someone who's not alive, and I can't talk to him and find out what his position is. But what I will do is I'll conduct an independent inquiry, if you like, but whatever the facts show, even if it shows you your son was guilty, I'm going to have to release it because it's not an attorney-client matter because I'm not going to be representing him. She said, that's all right, I'm sure he's innocent. So I went, I called the commission, wrote to the commission, said I'd like to appear, and I told them the purpose, and they said, no, we will have closed hearings, everything's top secret, and nothing will be revealed, and you cannot be present except they called me twice as a witness. I'm the only critic of the Warren Commission who ever actually testified before the Warren Commission. In any event, that's how I got involved in it. And the more I was involved, the more interested I was, and the more I talked to witnesses all over the place, all the witnesses in Dallas. Uh, and, and I actually interviewed them on film and released a documentary film called Rush to Judgment, which has the actual voices and pictures of interviews with people who were eyewitnesses to the assassination, eyewitnesses to how Ruby got into the basement, all of that kind of stuff which had been covered up. That's the history of how I got involved. I never planned it to be something which would dominate so much of my life. Folks, our guest tonight, of course, Mark Lane, has been a lawyer for Lee Harvey Oswald, has been a lawyer for AIM, the American Indian um, Movement. Thank you very much. I was going to say Indigenous Movement during Wounded Knee, 1973. And of course, Jonestown, the People's Temple, Jim Jones, 1978 got a few more questions on the JFK conspiracy. As most people who are fans of this show know, we've had first-person witnesses on, too. Dr. McClellan's been on. Uh, Mark, just to let you know. James... Abraham Bolden. Absolutely. James Tague's been on as well, as uh -huh. well as all the uh, the top-notch researchers uh, involved in the case. I actually uh, know A. Bolden. I interviewed him when he was in prison. I knew that that was outrageous, and he talks about this in his book, Echoes from Dealey Plaza. That's right. And that is that when I heard... The that he was sent to this penitentiary where there is, where part of the prison is a mental ward. I was very concerned, and I told him I was really concerned about that, that they might try to put him in this mental ward and claim that he was insane. 
Of course, what he had to say was he was a member of the Secret Service, as you know. He was the uh, black American, yes, right. the only the first black person ever on the White House detail of the Secret Service, personally selected by John Kennedy That's to, right. to protect him. He's an American and, hero, folks, a true American yeah. hero. And uh, he got there, and fellow Secret Service agents, a number of them said, we will never put our body in place in front of the president if they try to kill him. He's a nigger lover. Mm. He's destroyed America. And uh, if he gets killed, that's fine. We will never do anything to protect him. And if you look at the Zapruder film, that's a, an eight millimeter film, Bell and Howell camera taken by Abraham Zapruder, who's up there on the grass, you know, filming the assassination. He thought he was going to film the president going by in a motorcade and a parade. Instead, he filmed the assassination of the president. The car slowed down almost to a stop. And of course, the first training of the Secret Service is if there's any danger, you hear a shot or anything like that, step on the gas, get out of there. Exactly. Instead, they did just the reverse. The car was driven by a Secret Service agent. The right front of the car, the passenger side of the front seat, was another Secret Service agent. His job was to leap over the seat and knock the president down and cover him with his body. He had 5.6 seconds, which is an attorney after a shot is fired at the president, and he never moved. If he had knocked the president down after the first bullet hit the president in the back, Kennedy would have survived, obviously. But he took no position at all. He just stayed perfectly still as a car almost came to a stop and then the president was assassinated. Bolden then provided information. He wanted to tell the Warren Commission that the Secret Service had in fact said, in essence, that's what they would do. If there was an attempt to kill the president, they would not protect him. When uh, he was trying to contact the Warren Commission, instead he was arrested and framed and sent to prison. And then they were going to send him in a mental institution. But I had warned him that the prison he was going to had a mental ward and they have to go through a whole big procedure to move someone from the prison part to the mental ward part, which they didn't do. They just put him in that mental ward, violating all of their own regulations, and they started giving him these mind-altering drugs. About this, there's no question. He writes about it, and it's really clear there's a lawsuit about it. And at that point, he wrote a letter to his wife. Since he knew that this was a possibility, we had discussed it, he wrote a letter to his wife, and they had a code, because he knew everything would be read, and the code was that if you see an eye which has a circle dot, I think that's what it was, a circle dot on it, instead of just a point, just a little circle around it. That means contact the lawyer, get someone down here once. She got that letter, got the lawyer down there. They found he was in a mental ward. They got him out immediately back into the prison facility. But that's how that was thwarted. Anyway, he is an American hero, and I just met him uh, before he went to prison and spent some time with him recently because I filmed also an interview of him for our new expanded documentary, and he plays a major part in it, and I have the greatest respect for him. He's, a, well, he's on your show, you know. Oh, he's been on the show twice and he has, huh? uh, folks he's just the, the most wonderful warm human being you'll ever want to speak with yeah. he is truly um, just an amazing person and steadfast in his belief no matter what they did to him he just stood up against insurmountable persecution and stood his ground and yes, he, he, tr he truly is an exceptional role model. If you've got kids out there, folks, and you want a true role model, that's the guy for you. The shows are there, www.brenthollandshow.com. It's in the archives. Is Mark Lane, who was our guest today. His show will be in the archives. We're talking about the JFK assassination, of course. I'm sure a lot of our listeners out there want to know why Kennedy was killed. And I will come back to the CIA. I know about a half an hour ago, Mark mentioned that he believes the CIA killed JFK. And he's got some great proof relaying to that thesis. We'll come back to that in a second. You're listening to The Brent Holland Show. For more information on today's guests, as well as free podcasts and downloads, please go to the www.brenthollandshow.com website. www.brenthollandshow.com Com. Why was JFK killed, and why should people today even care what happened some 47 years ago? I wrote the legislation which set up the House Select Committee on Assassinations. That's a committee of the United States House of Representatives. And I traveled around the country, spoke at 180 colleges and universities and law schools, formed citizens commissions of inquiry at each of them, and together all of us got more than a million letters and telegrams to members of Congress demanding that there be an investigation. And so they formed the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And a lot of people don't realize that, I mean, there are some, a few people who 
people who say the Warren Commission was correct, etc., and that's the official government position. It's not the official government position. The last official government position on the question was the House Select Committee on Assassinations, which said in all probability there had been a conspiracy to kill President that's Kennedy, right. and in all probability there had been a conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King Jr. That's right. So that's the official position of the United States government now, which a lot of people miss. John Kennedy was about to dissolve the Central Intelligence Agency because he felt that they had, he knew that they had deliberately misled him on any number of matters. He was about to end the war in Vietnam, which the CIA at that time said it may be a dirty little war, but it's the only one we have. It was a war basically run in large measure by the Central Intelligence Agency. And whatever other motives there could have been, we don't know. We did have a trial on this question, and most people don't know about this. That's what the book Plausible Denial that you have made reference to. To it, right? E. Howard Hunt, the Watergate burglar, who was a convict, was named in a very right-wing newspaper called The Spotlight in an article by Victor Marchetti, who had been an officer of the CIA, who had left that organization, and said that Hunt was involved with the CIA in the assassination of President Kennedy. Hunt came out of prison and sued the newspaper and won, and they awarded him $650,000 for his good reputation, although they just got out of prison after some years for trying to destroy the American democracy and the Watergate. In any event, he filed a lawsuit and he won, but an error was made by the judge and instructions to the jury were sent back for a new trial, and then the newspaper asked me to represent them. I'd never heard of the newspaper. I didn't even know about the story at all, but they then asked me to represent them. I did, and we won the case. And what was our defense? That the article was correct, not basically absence of malice or something, those technical defenses. I said to the jury, the CIA killed your president, and we're going to prove it to you at this trial. And the full woman came out. We won the case unanimously. The full woman came out and said, uh, when we started this case, I believed in mom, apple pie, and the American justice system. Now I believe in mom and apple pie. Mm. And she said, there's no doubt in my mind that we are convinced that the CIA killed our president. So we have a jury verdict, the only jury verdict on the question. It was a jury chose by both sides to be impartial and fair. A very fair judge at the trial will allow just relevant evidence in, and they heard the evidence, and that was their conclusion. So we have the committee of the Congress, and we have the jury verdict. If you thought what Mark just said was explosive, stick around. Next time on Brent Holland, Mark Lane exposes the who and the why of the assassination, and you'll never believe what agency was behind it. Mark Lane. I recently been talking to St. John Hunt, who was E. Howard Hunt's son. His mother said to him that his father had been in Dallas, and St. John Hunt said that when my father was dying, he said to me, Mark Lane was right. I and the CIA were involved in the assassination, that I was correct, and he had played a part, and St. John Hunt said that to me in writing, actually. Wow, that's explosive, Mark. She also said that Jerry Patrick Hemming yes, was part yes. of it. Now, he also was a CIA killer. We know that. That's right. You're listening to The Brent Holland Show. For more information on today's guests, as well as free podcasts and downloads, please go to the www.brenthollandshow.com website. www.brenthollandshow.com As always, www.brenthollandshow.com do your real live history research there. Grab those quotes from the people that went through these tumultuous times in their own words. I am Brent Holland. Join us next time. Don't miss that show if you want to know who killed President Kennedy. See you next time. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to the show. I am excited today like never before. We continue with part two of the JFK assassination. This afternoon, Mark Lane returns. This afternoon, he shows us the who and the why of the JFK assassination. And make no mistake, folks, it was a conspiracy. Mark Lane. I recently been talking to St. John Hunt, who was E. Howard Hunt's son. His mother said to him that his father had been in Dallas. And St. John Hunt said, when my father was dying, he said to me, Mark Lane was right. I and the CIA were involved in the assassination, that I was correct, and he had played a part. And St. John Hunt said that to me in writing, actually. Wow, that's explosive, Mark. She also said that Jerry Patrick Hemming Yes. Part yes. of it. Now, he also was a CIA killer. We know that. That's right. This afternoon, living history, folks. Mark Lane, the JFK assassination, right now on Brent Holland. We did get off track a little bit. I just okay. want to go back a little bit to the CIA. Okay. And if you could mention Miss Lorenz. 
Marie Lorenz was a witness to a number of things. She had worked for the CIA for some time. She had a romantic relationship with Fidel Castro. It's a long, interesting story, but I'm not sure we have time for it, but I'll try to do it in a sentence or two. Her father was a captain of a German luxury liner, which was in Havana on January 1st, 1959, when Fidel Castro's revolution was successful. And Castro came into Havana, saw the beautiful boat, and went on board. Not long after he won the revolution, and he met this extremely beautiful, young, very young woman, the daughter of the captain. They liked each other, and he said, would you like me to show you what Cuba looks like in my Jeep? And they left, mm. and they lived together for some time. When she came back, the CIA recruited her in an effort to have her go back and kill Castro. That was one of those many attempts that the Church Committee of the United States Senate uncovered of the CIA trying to assassinate Fidel Castro. She was involved with them in a number of acts of getting weapons and sending to Cuba to overthrow Castro because of personal problems that developed between her and Fidel. We don't have time for that now. But in any event, uh, she was then recruited by Frank Sturgis, who was a CIA operative. And a lot of this isn't known about him for some reason, but he ran, his name was Frank Fiorino, mm -hmm. he used the name Frank Sturgis. He ran the Cuban Air Force under Castro, and he was working with the CIA at that time. Well, that I didn't know, Mark. Yeah. See that? You just educated me. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> bizarre kind of thing. Uh, he's the one that told Marita that Fidel's going to kill you, you better get out of here. That's why she was so upset with him. Anyway, right now she's working with him. He's a CIA operative out of Miami, and he said, this is the big one coming up. It was November 1963, and they got into some cars with some Cubans, two of them, the Novo brothers, and they drove to Dallas, checked into a, a motel. Eduardo, she said, was the person who was the paymaster for the operation. This was her testimony, which means it was under oath in in the trial in the United States District Court in Florida in the case of Hunt against the Liberty Lobby and the newspaper The Spotlight. And she told us gave specific information. She was cross-examined. The jury heard all of it. And uh, she said we went there and Eduardo was there and Eduardo was the paymaster running the operation. And Eduardo was E. Howard Hunt. And that was the CIA code name, Eduardo, not much of a code name, but that's been documented and Hunt actually admitted that. So let me just jump forward for one second. I recently been talking to St. John Hunt, who was E. Howard Hunt's son. That's right. Mm -hmm. He said to me, and he wrote that I could use this publicly, because when Hunt filed this lawsuit against the newspaper, he said, I was at home with my children and my wife for 72 hours after Kennedy was killed. Heard about the president being shot in the car, drove back home outside of Washington, and stayed there with my wife and my children, St. John Hunt, gave all the names, who were there the whole time. For 72 hours, we never left the house. We're all together. St. John Hunt said, number one, he was there. That is, St. John Hunt was there with his siblings and with his mother and with an aunt. E. Howard Hunt was not present, however, at all. Number one. Number two, his mother said to him that his father had been in Dallas. And number three, St. John Hunt said that when my father was dying, he said to me, Mark Lane was right. I and the CIA were involved in the assassination. I have to tell you that now. It wasn't exactly those many words, just that I was correct. And he had played a part. And St. John Hunt said that to me in writing, actually. Wow, that's explosive, Mark. She also said that Jerry Patrick Hemming yes, was part yes. of it. Now, he also was a CIA killer, we know that. That's right. And I was in Miami after this happened and after she made that statement, and I called Hemming. I had his number, and I called him and said, I wonder if I can talk to you about Marita Lorenz's testimony. I said, my name is Mark Lane. He said, I know who you are. Whoa. I said, okay. You want to meet? I was at a big hotel. And when can you? He said, I can do it now. I could be there in an hour. I said, okay. And I gave him the hotel. And I said, I'll meet you in the lobby. Smart move. Just call me up from the lobby. He said, okay, that's what I'll do, Mr. Lane. I called down to the desk. And if anybody comes looking for me, asking my room, don't give it. We never give room the numbers. I said, okay. Especially don't give this room to anybody now. He said, okay. Fifteen minutes later, there's a knock on my door. And I open up. It's Jerry Patrick Hemming. We went out in the lobby. <laughs> and he walked in the room. And I don't know if he was armed enough, but he was about 6'6 six, six and weighed about 290 pounds or something. Oh. He just threw me out of the window if he wanted to, I guess. Anyway, he came in. He said, okay, I want to talk to you about Marita. I said, listen, it's such a beautiful day. Why don't we go for a walk? He said, okay. So we went for a walk on the ground. Good Which man. Did he feel a little better? I told him exactly what Marita Lorenz had said. It was a two-car caravan. Sturgis was there. He was there. The Novo brothers were there. Other Cubans were there. Went to Dallas. And in Dallas, Eduardo, who was a Howard Hunt, paid Sturgis off for the operation. 
confused. He said, yeah, all right, so what's the question? I said, is that true? He said, no. Oh. He said it was a three-car caravan. Oh. Everything else is true. Oh, my God. So that was Hemings' statement to me. Now, Mark, you mentioned that E. Howard Hunt paid everybody. Where did the money come from? Where was it yeah. financed out of? Well, they assumed that since Hunt was CIA, and they were all working for CIA, they just presumed it was made available by the Central Intelligence Agency. Any speculation mafia dollars may have been, been involved? Well, I don't see any indications of that at all. Okay. You know, at that time, you got to remember, mm -hmm. that time, the uh, mafia and the CIA were working together in planning the assassination of Fidel Castro. That's right. And That's various things. Operation so it, 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 it's possible there was there was an interleaking because they worked together on other projects. But everything I've seen, Sturgis was CIA. Exactly. Henning was CIA. The Nova Brothers were CIA. They weren't arrested. The Nova Brothers. Do you remember the killing of Orlando Letelier in Washington D.C. after Allende had been overthrown by the CIA in Chile? He came to the United States and he was working with an American woman named Randy Moffat, and uh, they were. In Washington, D.C., and they were murdered. It was a big, big story at the time because the murder right in Washington, D.C. Sure. of a guy who was a diplomat and an American woman who was working with him. The Novo brothers, who were in the caravan to kill Kennedy, who were both convicted of murder of Letelier and Moffat. And had they been arrested in 1963, based upon what Marita was trying to mm -hmm. tell the government, mm -hmm. they would not have killed these two folks in Washington later on. Okay, now I've got a heavy question to ask. Was there anybody beyond E. Howard Hunt, above him, pulling the strings, and who was that person, if there well, was? Well, I don't know the answer. I don't know that, I presume, of course, because he was not a policymaker. Exactly, yeah. So I, I believe that to be true. I don't have a name, and I don't have any proof of that. That's the whole idea of having a government which uh, has a prosecuting authority. They bring these people in, and they threaten them, and they tell them they do not with abuse, but they threaten them that they will be given the maximum penalty unless they become witnesses for the government and give them further information. That's so almost every crime is solved as you go up a ladder that way because the government was covering this up so that didn't take place so we well, the left to speculate but I don't do that. You must be clairvoyant. I was going to ask you why some 47 years later with all that has been exposed how come no disclosure at this point? The last I heard the government was saying that Oswald was alone with that. You take that position still. Obviously not the Congress because they've issued a report they've investigated but the FBI which is a branch of the investigation part of the Department of Justice takes that position. So far as I know, it's still their position. Why should students today care that Kennedy was assassinated and the government was involved and it's been covered up all these years? You know, if you kill the president of the most powerful country of the world during a nuclear age, you've taken a step which imperils everybody on the planet. And when the government not only did that, but then prevented the facts from being known, it means that they have a license in the 007 almost to do what they feel is appropriate in the future without fear of being prosecuted for a crime. So I think it's not as pressing today, I guess, as it was 40 years ago. There was a member of Congress from the South, actually, who uh, joined our effort to have the Congress investigate the Kennedy assassination. His name is Richardson Pryor. And I said, why are you doing this, Congressman Pryor? And he said, nothing is settled until it is settled properly. Mm. And I think that's true, and I think that's why this is an issue which has not been settled properly and should be. For you, those of you that are just joining us right now, our guest today is Mark Lane, and we're talking about the JFK assassination. Mark Lane, of course, was the lawyer who represented Lee Harvey Oswald after he was killed. Marguerite Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald's mom, had asked him to do that, and he's, he was the groundbreaker for all the research that came afterwards. Rush to Judgment is his best-selling book and also just go on youtube plug in rush to judgment and watch that video it's great it's terrific essentially the warren commission at that time they came out and said that it was lee harvey oswald alone do you think johnson was behind that and set it up that way I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I can tell you why the Warren Commission reached that conclusion. The Commission started this investigation. They brought in lawyers from various places around the country. They wanted to bring in a really good lawyer from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was the district attorney there, very talented, intelligent. But, but he wasn't going to do that. He had his job. He said, I can send you a young man or assistant here named Arlen Specter. <laughs> he sent Arlen Specter there. Arlen Specter, <laughs> together with David Bellin, invented the magic bullet theory. Yeah, single bullet. Where one bullet did the most astonishing things in an acrobatic sequence. I think, Mark, actually that bullet belongs with Cirque du Soleil. Yes, it, it really was quite 
great there's athletics. In England, Arlen Specter then became the, the United States Senator for all of these years, just recently defeated, based upon his line to the American people about how he contrived this. And I'll tell you why they did it, though. I know why they did it. I didn't know it at that time. I know it now because I've seen all of these documents which we've gotten under the Freedom of Information Act. The CIA met with Earl Warren and gave him a briefing. And this is what the CIA said. This is the legend they gave him. In September of 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald went to Mexico City. He went to the Cuban embassy, and we have absolute proof of that. Then he went to the Soviet embassy, and we have proof of that. We have photographs of him, and we have a tape recording of him. When he called the Soviet embassy from Mexico City, he's right there, he called them, and he said he wanted to see Kostikov. Is he in? This is Lee Harvey Oswald calling. In other words, the tape recording showed that Oswald had a relationship with Kostikov. Kostikov, according to the CIA, and this I think is accurate, although he was called the secretary, deputy secretary, something of the embassy, was the KGB agent for the Soviet Union in charge of assassinations in the Western Hemisphere. And here's Oswald meeting with him in September 1963, two months before, according to the CIA, he went back to the United States and killed the president. And Warren is listening to this briefing, and the CIA continues, we have conducted a thorough investigation. We are convinced of that. Any question, Lee Harvey Oswald was assassinated and that he acted alone. But if this information comes out about his going to Mexico City, meeting with the Cubans and the Russians, including the KGB guy in charge of assassinations in the Western Hemisphere, then coming back to the United States and killing the president, no one will believe there was no conspiracy involving the Russians or the Cubans. And the whole idea was that, according to the CIA, Oswald was going to kill the president, then he was going to go back to Mexico City, and from there fly off to Cuba. So that's why he went with the Cubans, the Russians, because it was Kostikov who was an expert in assassinations, according to the CIA. Of course, you can see Warren, the blood draining out of his face as he is. They said the only way to save America, because if this comes out, what will happen is the American people believe that the, the Russians were involved, the Cubans were involved, the man war, 100 million Americans could be killed in a war. 40 million could be killed in a war. You have to do what will save America now. And Warren went out, and we have the minutes of the first meeting of January 64, where he talks to the staff, the lawyers, where he says basically truth is no longer our objective. We cannot have 40 million Americans die because of our investigation. And that's, there's a record of this. I have those minutes. It was top secret at the time. I have them now. And he's talking about 40 million Americans. He didn't say why, but how were 40 million Americans going to die? Even when I debated one of his friends, Al Weirin, A.L. Weirin, who was the uh, head of the ACLU in, in Los Angeles, a, a legal giant and a great liberal. I debated him at Beverly Hills High School, packed auditorium, and he had other Warren Commission lawyers with him and I was alone on the stage he said he knew the story he didn't get it from me because I hadn't seen those documents then but he got it from Warren <laughs> and he said to the audience and these are very intelligent folks in Beverly Hills which were a packed place an awful lot of people I've got how many well over a thousand I believe I'm not even sure the number it was a huge auditorium very interested people they wanted to hear what this was about you could see this debate and Warren said I say thank God for Earl Warren he saved America from a pogrom by saying that Oswald was the lone assassin, I say thank God for him. Oh, and I said, I have one question for you, Mr. Weirin. Do you still say thank God for Earl Warren, even if Oswald was innocent? And he said, yes. Huh. At that time, the audience, and he had been the hero for years out there, started to boo. I had to beg them to stop so that they could go on. They booed and they shouted, shame, shame, etc. at him. But he knew the story, and a few other people who knew Warren knew the story, because Warren no doubt told them, I have no choice. I have to do this to save the country. Why Warren issued the report, and of course it was led by Alan Dulles, former director of the CIA. If you read the 26 volumes of evidence compiled by the commission, the first 15 of, of the testimony, and if you read those, you'll see that Dulles is always there and always playing a major part. Read the minutes of the Warren Commission meetings. You see, he plays a major part, much more active than Warren and much more active than anybody else. And he had been the director of the CIA who had said had been fired by John Kennedy for lying. You're listening to The Brent Holland Show. For more information on today's guests as well as free podcasts and downloads, please go to the www.brenthollandshow.com website. www.brenthollandshow.com 
Com. Mark, I just want to mention to the folks, too, that Bobby Kennedy, upon learning about his brother's assassination, the first thing he did was call John McCone into his office, well, not his office, his backyard, and asked him. John McCone, by the way, folks, was the head of the CIA in 1963, handpicked by Kennedy. But he was out of the loop. A lot of the stuff that was going on in the CIA, they were not telling the head of the CIA. Can you believe that? Bobby Kennedy's first reaction was the CIA he had killed. The the CIA killed. That's right. Did they kill? And John McCone said, no, not to the best of my knowledge. Now that's ice chilling. The other thing I want to mention, I want to ask you, do you think that a lot of the residue from the Cuban Missile Crisis, because let's not forget, folks, October 1962, just a little over a year before that, everybody went through that horrible time, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you want some great background in that, I had Ted Sorensen on a couple of months ago for four shows, two hours, just electric, and he took us through that whole process. So just check that out on the www.brenthollandshow.com website. Do you think a lot of that residue and the fear of perhaps a nuclear war was getting the best of their judgment? Uh, I'm not sure about that, but I do know that they were very concerned, because that was a year before, mm-hmm. they were very concerned about the fact that a year after that, actually September of 63, uh, John Kennedy withdrew 1,000, we called them advisors from Vietnam, from Vietnam. 18,000 yeah. of them. That was mm-hmm. the position. We took publicly, we had 18,000 there, and he withdrew 1,000 of them. They were the Green Beret Special Forces teams there, called advisors. And he said, well, we'll be, they'll be out by the end of next year. And then in November, he withdrew another 1,000, down to 16,000, saying they'll all be home before the end of next year. Then he was killed. Then we had 500,000 take their place after Lyndon Johnson became president, shifting our policy on Vietnam, which is attributable to, of course, the death of the president. Now, in Oliver Stone's film, JFK, he attributes that particular war to the death of Kennedy. Do you believe in that thesis? I think that played a major part, yeah. I think there was many reasons myself. I don't think there was just one singular reason, which leads me to executive action. Do you want to discuss that a little bit? Sure. That'd That's be a film great. that I wrote with Donald Freed. A good friend of mine was Donald Sutherland, and he was going to produce it. It was so clear what that film said. The film said basically the CIA killed President Kennedy. I wrote it with Donald Freed, as I said, and then Donald was unable to get raise funds for it. So he sold it to a guy named Ed Lewis, and Ed Lewis brought in someone to rewrite it. Dalton Trumbo was a good writer, actually. Donald was so committed to this project. Donald's a very very bright person. I think a wonderful actor. Well, he's Canadian, you know that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and his son is Kiefer Sutherland, by the way, folks, uh, the, the show 24. You're listening to The Brent Holland Show. For more information on today's guests, as well as free podcasts and downloads, please go to the www.brenthollandshow.com website. www.brenthollandshow.com Donald said... And we called it executive action, which is the phrase used by the CIA, meaning uh, killing the head of the state. Donald loved the title, but Donald was very clever, too. And he said, I think we should call it executive action. And all the movie marquees around the country will put the word conspiracy in America. But the first letter of each word will be red, the rest will be black. In other words... CIA. CIA. But he couldn't get the funds for it, so he gave it to uh, Ed Lewis. Ed Lewis then had it rewritten, and only one group is exonerated in the entire film. I think that's when uh, Will Gear is asked, Burt Lancaster, I'm not even sure now, Burt Lancaster was a friend of mine too, <laughs> and we had discussions about this, but he is asked, are you saying the CIA was involved? And the answer was absolutely not. So from a film which said the CIA did it, we had a film which only cleared one organization in the entire country, and that was the CIA. That's the way the executive action was changed. But it still, it was the first movie, and I think it was only several years after President Kennedy's assassination, that raised the question once again, and you were integral in this, and this is the point I want to get across to you folks, Mark Lane was integral in bringing forward and challenging the Warren Commission and the government of the United States, first with his best-selling book, Rush to Judgment, and that, just a couple of years later, was turned into um, a documentary. And then he came out with a feature film starring all these great actors. Um, yeah, Donald Sutherland, Robert Ryan's last oh, film, yeah. I believe. 
Tim Wilkier, yeah. Yeah, and it's just an amazing movie. Uh, I have it at home. It challenged... Yeah, it, did, it did focus a lot of attention on the on the matter. In fact, it was a really extremely successful. It was a low-budget film. As I recall, it was $600,000, because things are more expensive now, but even then, that was a very low budget for these kind of folks they had in it. And it made $18 million, $18 million in the first few months, and was wildly successful. I mean, it was withdrawn, and it was withdrawn for a long time. Now it's out, I think, in video. It also showed two teams in the field practicing triangulated fire. Yeah, that's something that we actually did right that stayed in, right? Yeah, because that just brought it right forward and said, oh my God, there it is, they're practicing. And when you just transpose that as a template right over to Daily Plaza, you can see how it all comes together. Yes. And that, for the first time for me, just went... Oh, yeah, this is it. Sure. It's a groundbreaking film, actually. Oh, it, because, absolutely. Not only about the Kennedy assassination, but about secret government operations, because a few of them came out after that. Parallax view. Sure. Was it hard to get the actors? Because, I mean, you had some heavy-hitting actors. I mean, these were the top-notch folks in those days. I Bill Executive Bur- actually, well, I played yeah. no part in that, because it had been turned over from Donald to Ed Lewis, and Ed Lewis then took it from there. Had oh, it rewritten and I got see. the actors. But I knew, I did know Burt, actually. Burt Lancaster. And, yeah. yeah, and he was a friend and um, I met him in New York after that, actually, and out in California a couple of times also. He was a very good guy. In fact, we had a lot of things to talk about because my law office, for the first 10 years I practiced law, was in East Harlem, the most depressed areas in in all of New York City, Spanish, uh, black community, Hispanic, uh, Puerto Rican black community. One of the groups that I worked with there was the Union Settlement House, and Brett Lancaster had worked there long before me, and uh, I did some athletic stuff there. You know, he was a, uh, a really remarkable athlete. He was a trapeze artist. That's right. The Crimson uh, Pirate. He was in a movie called The Crimson Pirate, and my brother and I used to stay up late at night to watch this film. He did his own stunts in most of these things, even on on trapeze. He was in a film called Trapeze. That's right, he was, he was. He was on a trapeze. Anyway, he was a remarkable guy. He did this film because of the issues involved, and I didn't talk to him for a good period of time. I mean, we just didn't see each other regularly anyway. It's not that I stopped talking, we just didn't run into each other until after the film was made, and then I thought my brother had a lot of problems with his which you told me that at the time. I said, well, you know, I'm happy that the film came out. I think it was a lot better when I told the truth <laughs> rather than try to cover up. But there was enough in there to raise serious questions. And the same thing with, with Oliver Stone's film. There's a lot of problems with that film because he mixed facts with fiction. When you do that about a subject which is still a controversial subject on the agenda, you're really inviting fair criticism. And, and you got a lot of that. You also got a lot of unfair criticism. I agree with you on the unfair criticism for sure. I've heard all of over many, many times try to explain what he was trying to do, and it was a monumental task without question, trying to bring all that information into that time frame and try and keep people clear on what was going on, etc., etc. But what that did was similar to what your films have done, was brought it back again. Brought it no right into the forefront. So much so that Clinton actually released a bunch of files after that. He was president at the time. We're talking about the film JFK, folks, by Oliver Stone. Amazing film. I'm sure you've all seen it on the History Channel now several times. One final question about JFK. Sherry Feaster was on the show. Sherry Feaster, folks, is a Dallas senior CSI crime scene investigator. She examined the Zapruder film. The Zapruder film, that famous film you've all seen by now, was in the movie JFK. You know, the one back and to the left, back and to the left. That is the JFK Zapruder film. She examined that film for blood spatters as a crime scene investigator using 21st century techniques, and she found a frontal shot. But, I should qualify this, she found a frontal shot from the opposite side, the south side of... Daily Plaza. Do you know of her work at all, Mark? I read about it. I haven't really studied it. The bullet that hit the president came, that killed the president. I yes. mean, by several shots were fired. But the bullet which hit him in the head came from his right front because, first of all, you see the effect on the president. He's driven backward and to the left suddenly, number one. Number two, there was a police officer on a motorbike behind him who said he was almost knocked off his motorbike by brain and skull material which hit him. That was to the left rear of the president. There's no question the shot which killed the president came from the right front. And then there were eyewitnesses like Charles Brem and others Mm -hmm. who saw the same thing. They're standing right there, just a few feet away. There may have been shots from other areas, and maybe that's what the uh, investigation shows, but there's no question the bullet which killed the president came from the right front. And everybody on the railroad overpass, a lot of them are in our film that we interviewed, S.M. Holland, R.C. Doug, the various folks who worked for the Union Terminal Railroad, up there 
they're watching. They not only heard the shot, but the guys on the, on the railroad bridge ran behind the wooden fence because they saw puffs of smoke come from That's there. Right. So uh, there's no question that the shot came from there. That was the shot that killed them, I believe. Do you believe Lee Harvey Oswald fired a rifle that day at President no. Kennedy? No. Okay. I think he had nothing to do with the Kennedy assassination. The so. Tippett assassination? I'm sorry? The nothing. Tippett assassination? Nothing, eh? I found that one witness to the Tippett assassination. Her name is Aquila Clemens, and she's in that documentary film. That's right. It. That's why I asked. And she yeah. said there were two men involved, shown pictures of Oswald, told his size and shape. She said he was neither one of those two, but there were two other men there who were involved. The Warren Commission said she didn't exist. That's in their warrant. That's in the rule. That's listed in the speculations and rumors that this woman exists. <laughs> yeah, there she is in the film. <laughs> yep, she certainly does. She certainly does. And they just chose to discard it. Folks, we're speaking with living history today, Mark Lane. I am so excited to have this guy. This man has been in the thick of it. He's been right there, center stage. He's represented Lee Harvey Oswald, of course, after Lee Harvey Oswald was... I don't really represent him. Okay, how would, how would you say I told his mother that I would conduct an independent investigation. Okay, fair tell enough. what the truth was, but I know what you're saying. Fair I enough. did present his interests. Now that, folks, was an explosive series of two shows. Real Living History, Mark Lane. His shows can be found in the archives, www.brenthollandshow.com. Don't forget, he was live in Jonestown, 1978, during that massacre, and he survived it. That shows in the archives. Also, he was the lawyer for AIM, the American Indian Movement, the Wounded Knee Uprising, 1973. Don't forget, Abraham Bolden's show is in the archives as well. The first African-American Secret Service agent, handpicked by John F. Kennedy himself, and he blew the whistle on the Secret Service after the assassination. Don't miss that show either. Living history, it doesn't get any more real than that. This JFK assassination series of shows, folks, I will be doing more on them real living history first person witnesses those shows will be coming up in the future dr robert mcclelland who worked on jfk at parkland hospital beverly oliver who was right there you can see her in the Sapruder film james Tagg, who inadvertently was responsible for the single bullet theory don't miss those shows this is serious serious stuff i want to thank you all for joining us for these past two shows stick around folks more great stuff coming up on the brent holland show i'm brent holland thank you all for listening see you next time 